So um, we'll start again now with um, the verses. So hopefully the idea of the object of negation is a fruitful discussion, something that's uh, interesting, dynamic, confronting perhaps. Um, I thought I would read a passage from Chudan Rinpoche to see if it helps clarify. Once I've read it, if you still have kind of questions, then let's do those. Okay, so um, we'll uh, clarify it using Chudan Rinpoche's words and then we'll have a, just a brief discussion and then go on with the last verses. So I left you at the end of the Bodhicitta section last time we spoke. And the summary was this verse, and I think I haven't matched up the Hebrew correctly, so excuse me. But it's basically, in short, if like the mother whose cherished son has fallen into a pit of fire and who experiences even one second of his suffering as an unbearable eternity, your reflection on the suffering of all mother sentient beings has made it impossible for you to bear their suffering for even one second. In the wish-seeking enlightenment, <clears throat> for their sake arises without effort, then you have realized the supreme precious mind of enlightenment. So when you're feeling this way about everyone, all the time, spontaneously, without effort, then you have actual bodhicitta, and you're an actual bodhisattva. And that kind of gives you a drive to even more want to get out of samsara, so you can be of more use. So without the wisdom realizing ultimate reality, even though you have generated renunciation and the mind of enlightenment, you cannot cut the root cause of circling. Therefore, attempt the method to realize dependent arising. So the key part here is to realize, in order to realize emptiness, you need to realize dependent arising. Dependent arising is your access into emptiness. So that's the key point in this one. And then about the object of negation that we were just meditating on and discussing about, Chudan Rinpoche says, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Similarly, in the case of consciousness and so forth, if one of the remaining aggregates individually is not the person, yeah, each one of them is not the person, just like form is not the person, or breath is not the person. He says, this is because there would be many consciousnesses in the continuum of one person. And the consequence of that would be one person would become many and so forth. The way it appears to us is that the I that is merely imputed is somehow findable after having cleared away the aggregates that are the basis of designation and that the I, that is the object imputed through labeling, is established from within its basis of imputation. This is the object of negation. That findable I is the object of negation, right? So we should keep in mind and search to see whether there is something findable in the aggregates. Having considered that there is no I that does not rely on anything else, when a mere absence appears to the mind, it is known as the realization of the selflessness of the person. When mere absence appears, the only thing that we realize is that the I does not exist as it is grasped by the self-grasping of the person. It is not that we realize that the I is non-existent. At that time, Having made the distinction between these two, we realize that the conventional I, that is the I that is merely imputed upon the aggregates does exist. We also realize that the I that is established from its own side without relying on the aggregates does not exist. It is very important to make the distinction between that and the I that is merely imputed, okay? So that's the summary of this whole object of negation conversation. And you can kind of pick any aspect of your experience to start the examination with. And then that same understanding can be applied to all the other aggregates or pieces or aspects of experience. 
But does it make sense? The conventional I that exists conventionally, no problem. That which seems more than that or additional to that or the boss of that doesn't exist at all, even conventionally. And that's the one we believe in, right? That's the one we believe in is the one that's not there at all, even conventionally. We believe in the pretender, yeah? So you have to find it in order to not find it. What are your thoughts about that? Having kind of done the meditation and discussed it a bit, this whole premise of find the not finding, how did it go? Uh, me, uh, both Nitsan and I had uh, um, had discussed that the in order to um, find the negation of something, it's necessary to go through it very deeply. Yeah. And uh, and I had also once saw um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, t- uh, I was forgetting his name. I saw a talk on the FPMT Israel channel where he said that if we look for anger, the root of anger in ourselves doesn't actually exist. And, but which means that you have to shuffle through all that anger to get to the non-existing part and exactly. to let it dissolve. Um, beyond, that's what I managed to understand. But beyond that, I, um, it was a very confusing piece that we just read. So, Yeah, it's confusing in every language. You know, it's even if you have the best translator in the world speaking in your preferred vocabulary, it still would be a little confusing. The simplest explanation is to think that we feel and we experience more than what is actually there. We identify with something that is additional to reality. And then it's on shaky ground and it needs all these defenses and protections and you know story and convincing And there's this idea that you need to then gather things to it that support and protect it and push things away from it that hurt it. And you see this play out everywhere. You see it play out in the country and politics, but you see it play out in your own family dynamics and with your relationships of all kinds, that because we don't understand the way the self exists, then we don't exist the way we exist in relation to others either. So there's push and pull constantly. And there's, you know, attachment, fear, attachment, fear, come closer, go away, come closer, go away (laughs) all the time, you know, with objects, with food, with situations, with jobs, with everything. And so to find the non-finding, you have to pretend you don't already know where the analysis is going. You have to be careful not to outsmart yourself. So you know that there's no inherently existent self because you studied that, but you don't know that there's no inherently existent self, right? And so in order to really feel it, you have to make it come up. So you use praise, criticism, or danger. Yeah, praise, criticism, or danger. You can use other ways as well, but you need to kind of... um, escalate or amplify your eye experience more than when you're just having a casual conversation and feeling relaxed. Because when you're feeling relaxed, the eye is not shouting its existence so obviously. You know, so I think that it can be useful to use the breath because that's a kind of universal human experience. If you were suffocating, the eye would be very prominent. I am suffocating, I am dying, I can't breathe, you know, you know, that real fear would arise. Even if you just looked at the fact that the breath is just the body, and you're not the body, and the breath isn't even just one thing, you know, even after having just done that analysis seconds before, still, there's identification with it. And so it's very interesting. So you get it to appear, And then you, a little bit like a cop show interrogation, you have the eye there as the perpetrator of all the trouble. And then you become your own detective and you question it. And you say, prove it. You say you exist as you you are, you say so. Prove it, where, how, which one, show me. But if you're too aggressive, if you're bad cop instead of good cop, 
Then the I will run away and say, no, 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 I never said I was inherently existent. No, 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 that was just a bad day where for a minute I did, but generally I don't. So you can't go in with your interrogation with bad cop energy. You have to be good cop that says, look, I know it really feels like you seem that way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you want some coffee? You want a snack? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Understandable. Everything you've been doing. Understandable. So where were you <laughs> the night of blah, 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 when you yelled at your girlfriend or whatever? <laughs> and so, you know, you have to do this like gentle prodding. And then it kind of dissolves into dependency rather than dissolving into nothing, nothing. Yeah, it dissolves into interconnection. And you think that part that felt independent is actually related to these countless other things. And that part that felt me and independent was related to all these other things. And then you stop being able to find the driver or the boss or the owner and that's not the same as not finding anything, you know? It's just that the idea of one independent lump that's directing all of your choices by itself just fades naturally. And then this sort of like identity facade, I need to prove, I need to defend, it just kind of relaxes, you know? And it starts to feel like, a costume you're wearing, but no one is really the wearer. You know, it's just kind of like, here's some pieces here that are related to each other that have some impact on one another. I'll try and work with this collection. <laughs> I'm going to work with this collection, but who it is that's working with it, you know, it's sort of taking turns who is dominant. Sometimes intention is dominant. Sometimes discernment is dominant. Sometimes feeling is dominant, but none of those are in charge innately or inherently because you don't feel what you feel unless you came into contact with this or that and had this or that karma. And you don't describe or discern or recognize what you label or see or distinguish without your history and your context and your karma, right? And you don't move your mind and your body this way or that way, independent of what is going on around you and what's going on within you. But the false eye, the object of negation, thinks it's in charge. Is it, is it getting clearer? To, very much so to me. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Sarah. The, the passage that you just um, showed us on the screen and explained about the dependent arising and about the conventional I and the, the non-realistic I made, suddenly made so much sense to me. In the discussion group, I, I related to the meditation um, that you led us through, and I talked about choking experiences that I've had. Mm. And um, I said that although cognitively, in my head, I accept, I understand and accept that there is no self. During those three or four experiences of choking, suddenly the I comes back. As you said, in danger, the I comes back with such force and power to say, I can't breathe. I yeah. can't breathe. I said that fortunately, um, someone was here, my daughter was here to say to me, Dad, relax calm down it's okay and then but also the conventional i my conscious uh, thought took over but now um with the explanation that you just gave us at the big at the beginning of this part of the session i want to say why don't we start with an explanation of dependence arising <laughs> because and, suddenly yeah. It's such a lot fits into place. It's like you have to want to hear it. And to want to hear dependent arising, it, it helps to kind of throw some ideas of emptiness at you. To start with dependent arising is very skillful. And like Lama Tsongkhapa's praise to dependent arising is skirting around emptiness the whole time. It's just talking from the angle of dependency. You know, and then some texts, you know, go straight in with emptiness. 
And then once you kind of go straight in with emptiness, you realize there were some steps that were missed, which is to ask who is empty, what is empty, and what's the opposite of emptiness? Because the opposite of emptiness yeah. isn't dependent arising. The opposite of emptiness is inherence. Yeah. Right? So what is inherence? And then you look for that sense of inherence or intrinsic, you know, or self-creating, self-perpetuating, etc. You know, so it's like the opposite of emptiness is not dependent arising. The opposite of emptiness is inherence. And that is the problem that emptiness dispels. But in order for emptiness to dispel it, we have to access why things are empty. So dependent arising is why things are empty. It's the reason for their emptiness. Yeah, they're empty because mm. they're dependent. So, you know, kind of like you start where you start and then you have to plug in the other pieces. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so starting with dependent arising can be a good approach for sure. And then, of course, a lot of our teachers just kind of throw us in the deep end and see what happens. And then they tidy us up afterwards. And they're like, let's just see. <laughs> you know, off you go, kid. Yeah, it's quite interesting. So I'm going to. Yeah, you're welcome. And, and I'm going to drill in just in like one or two other verses and the rest will go through kind of quickly because we don't have tons of time. But please keep discussing it. And I think that um, that commentary by Chudun Rinpoche, an offering cloud of nectar is such a good commentary because it goes verse by verse. Um, a good commentary that's an overview of the text is um, Cutting Through Appearances by Geshe Zopa. So that one doesn't always go verse by verse. It kind of gives you the essence of each of the three principal aspects. And then it goes into like tenants, hardcore, the second half. So those are the two texts I really recommend for just follow-up um, study. But we're going to drill down into a few more of the verses now and just see how they land. So verse 10 says, One who sees the cause and effect of all phenomena of both cyclic existence and the state beyond sorrow is forever unbetraying, and for whom any object trusted in by the grasping mind has completely disappeared, has at that time entered the path pleasing the Buddhas. So this is showing or describing what the correct view will be. And it's very similar to that verse in Lama Chopa that a lot of you are familiar with, which says samsara and nirvana lack even an atom of true existence, while cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagarjuna's thought, which is that these two are complementary and not contradictory. So it's the same meaning. And this is, the, this is what we're aiming for. And then the text goes on to explain how to get there. So, Verse 11 says, if the appearance of dependent relation, which is unbetraying, is accepted separately from emptiness, and as long as they are seen as separate, then one has still not realized the Buddha's intent. So we start with the definition of not having completed the analysis of the correct view before we get into having completed the analysis of the correct view. So this is making us remember like from the Heart Sutra, Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. You know, that's gonna always be true. <laughs> so don't lose one side of it. If these two realizations are happening simultaneously without alternation and from merely seeing dependent relation as completely unbetraying, definite ascertainment comes that completely destroys the way all objects are apprehended as truly existent, at that time, the analysis of the ultimate view is complete. So this is what we're aiming for, or the measure of having completed the analysis of the, complete, of the correct view, when the both realizations, dependent arising and emptiness, are simultaneous at the same time, not going back and forth. And one reminds you of the other, 
So then this is the verse that we're going to drill down into because I think it's the most profound, but also the most confusing. So it says, furthermore, appearance eliminates the extreme of existence and emptiness eliminates the extreme of non-existence. If you realize how emptiness manifests in the manner of cause and effect, then you are not captivated by wrong notions holding extreme views. So this is the unique special quality of the Prasangika view, the middle way consequence view, which is the most subtle. So avoiding extremes is done through negating or canceling, contradicting, disproving. I can't pronounce the Hebrew, <laughs> these two main errors. So the extreme of existence, you negate the extreme of permanence which refers to eternalism. So when you see the extreme of permanence, don't think the general concept of permanent phenomena, such as space, which do exist. We're talking about the extreme of permanence. And this refers to eternalism, not externalism, eternalism. Okay, so this is the extreme of existence then the extreme of non-existence is more straightforward. The extreme of non-existence refers to the extreme of annihilation or nihilism. So we have to negate both sides in order to arrive at the middle way, in order to arrive at reality. So Chun Rinpoche says, first, how does appearance eliminate the extreme of existence? And Rinpoche says, to us, phenomena appear to be established from their own side without relying upon something else. But since this is not the case, they must be established through reliance on other things. If phenomena existed, having been established from their own side without relying on anything else, then reliance through other causes and conditions would not be known for them. Here, through reason of appearance, being dependent arising, we establish the aspect of emptiness that is empty of being established without reliance. So things are not unreliant, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Everything is reliant. So then he goes on to say, by saying that something is established without reliance is non-existence, we validate dependent arising, in which things are established by relying on many causes and conditions. For this reason, the text says that appearance eliminates the extreme of existence. When we posit appearance that is dependent arising to be established through reliance, we eliminate the extreme of existence that grasps it to be established from its own side. Yeah, so just kind of take that in. And then the other side, emptiness eliminates the extreme of non-existence regarding the statement that empty, regarding the statement that the empty state eliminates the extreme of non-existence the text asserts that since phenomena are empty of being established without reliance, they must be established through reliance. And by reason of being empty, we eliminate the extreme of nihilism. By saying that all phenomena are reliant on other phenomena, because something established without reliance does not exist, we state that when something appears to be an entity that relies or an entity established through reliance, then the empty state eliminates the extreme of non-existence. Okay, so the key feature in both of these is this principle of reliance. Yeah, for, for both appearance and emptiness, we're looking at the fact that absolutely everything that exists depends or relies. And the surface level is causes and conditions, which applies to all impermanent phenomena. But then you can go deeper to both permanent and impermanent phenomena, both. 
and permanent and impermanent phenomena all rely upon parts and whole, right? To be a whole or to be a person, you have to depend on parts. To be considered parts of a person, there has to be the concept of person, right? They're mutually dependent. There's also context, right? Like I am a tall person compared to, I don't know, Inav, who is a normal sized person, <laughs> right? So, but you know, she, compared to a child, she's a tall person, right? It's all contextual, right? And so that's true of impermanent, but also permanent things. They rely upon parts, they rely upon context. Okay, so they can't be non-existent or existent by themselves. And then deepest is everything is dependent upon a basis of designation, which has been validated by worldly convention, by valid cognition, valid cognition analyzing the ultimate, bigger discussion there, obviously, but a valid basis and a mind's imputation or a mind's labeling. And that's the subtlest, and that applies to everything. So when we're looking at appearance eliminates the extreme of existence and emptiness eliminates the extreme of non-existence, it almost feels like it should be stated the other way, right? It almost feels like it should be saying appearance eliminates the extreme of non-existence because look, they appear, <laughs> right? And emptiness eliminates the extreme of non-existence. What? But empty, what? You know, and what Lama Tsongkhapa is doing is making us go through some mental gymnastics to help us hit that point from another angle. And so it's going to take some thought and it's going to take, you read it and then you just go, okay, what? And you just have to think about it. And so in your next discussion group, really do kind of discuss how does that work and look at the commentary again and just kind of feel it out. And um, slowly, slowly, it'll get clearer. But this is a really powerful text and a very short and pithy text that would be very useful to read every day or once a week and just kind of keep these ideas fresh and alive in your mind. So we got to call it a day because we've got short sessions to keep it uh, kind of vibrant and pithy. But I hope that you guys keep talking about it because they're really important concepts. And if you get stuck on a question that no one really knows the answer to and everyone is really sharing the confusion, work on getting the question as tidy and simple and precise as you can, because then you can give it to the next teacher who's teaching. And those are the kind of questions we love the most because it's not full of, here's all the context about why I have this question. And here's all of the, my emotions around the question. It's just the question in its most essential form, which means you're probably going to get the clearest answer. And so it's a really good discipline to get your questions more and more refined and sharpened rather than feeling like you need to get an answer or finish an answer or have a solution work on getting really good group questions together because um, then you can really um, put your next teacher on the spot, whether it's me or somebody else or one of the Geshe's. So um, may the force be with you. Now we'll dedicate. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not yet arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, the incomparably kind Supreme Tenzin Gatso, may you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. What moves so changing, jang gong yo way? Ten zing yon pal way, kwan zua dua kwase. Chua song kwa way lay mohun tordru. 
Pahada Sadu Jagondu Shop Ten Show. And remembering the emptiness of the agent, the action, the object, ourselves, the action of studying and meditating, and what we're focusing on, the topic, all lack inherent existence because they dependently arise. Okay. Thanks everyone, it's lovely to see you and uh, see you next time. Yeah, we are done right after these sessions. You're leaving yes. us because you have other um, obligations. See you next time, whatever that is. But yeah, not this series. Yeah. Okay. But um, you know, if you want to revisit this series sometime, or if you want to drill down on one of them particularly, decide amongst yourselves. And um, I'll be able to look at schedule things. Maybe in August, I'll be able to start looking at things again. So we can touch base in August and schedule something else if you want, um, or if you've got other things going, that's cool too. Yeah.